Well, hey, I just want to welcome you to Anchor Church today. My name is Steve. I'm the pastor here at Anchor. Really glad that you decided to join us today. Our mission here at Anchor Church is to be anchored in the hope of Jesus Christ and then to express that hope in love, community, and service to others. Hope you're with us on that mission. Uh, if you're visiting, I just want to say welcome to you. So glad that you're here. Do us a favor. Just say hi in the comments. Say I'm new or hey, just checking you guys out today. Uh, you won't get bombarded. We just want to know that you're here and, and we want to say hi. And so uh, if you don't chime in or you don't say anything, we don't know. So, so please let us know that you're here this morning. Glad that you're here. I know, especially if you're a new visitor, this is a weird time to be visiting churches and to be exploring faith, but we do want to welcome you and big kudos to you again for choosing to join us of all the places that you could, could be watching um, or all the brunches you could be eating. So, so from us, we just want to say thank you. We're glad that you're here. We hope you're blessed by today's service and the message today, I think, is going to be a hopeful and encouraging one for you, okay? If you have been attending and you'd like to get more updates from us and know what's going on, we are communicating more and more via text and email, not spamming, but, but communicating once or twice a week, important things that are going on. And so uh, I just want to let you know that you can be a part of that and get those updates if you just uh, text the word LOOP, L-O-O-P, to 716-222-7155. Okay, if you text loop to that number, uh, you'll get a response from us, ask for some details, you'll be added into our newsletter and email chain and, and texting, all that. We'll, we'll get those things out to you. And again, we don't uh, do anything with that information other than to use it to communicate with you every now and then, okay? We just want you to be up to date with what's going on. So please feel free to do that, okay? Uh, also, uh, if you do do that, then you know that we have some things coming up uh, this month. Okay, the first of which is next weekend, September 13th. We're doing our last outdoor service. Uh, that's the last service we're going to do here at the church for the fall. And, and if you haven't seen that update, we'll be posting that so you can see on the website and on our Facebook page our fall plans, which is to meet virtually and see where uh, COVID takes us over the next couple months. Okay. Um, another thing that's happening though is at the end of the month, uh, the last Sunday of the month, September 29th, I believe, uh, we are going to have a baptism service. And so if you've not been baptized, I really would love for you to participate in this service out on Lake Erie. So it's going to be uh, safe for us to gather. There's going to be a nice breeze, I'm sure. And so uh, we, we can meet together on the lake and practice this ancient rite of baptism. And so if you've not been baptized, please reach out to me. You can do that either through our Facebook page, you can go to our website and send an email that way, um, but find a way to contact us. Say, hey, I'm interested in baptism. I'd love to follow up with you and give you some details on what that looks like, okay? Uh, and finally, uh, this is our last week in our current series on the life of Joseph called Resilient. Next week, we start a series that I'm very, very excited about called Foundations. And we're going to be digging into what it is that Christians have believed all through uh, our history over the last 2,000 years by looking at the Apostles' Creed and then digging into the theology of that, digging into what does it mean and why do we believe this and why does it matter and what does it look like if, if we live out these beliefs? Uh, what does that look like in our lives? What, how should we live then? So I really hope you're part of us. Over, uh, We're going to be doing that over a five-week period. would love for you to join us in that. If you're curious about the Christian faith or you know someone who is, or or you just want to kind of block out kind of some of the craziness for a little bit of time and just say, I want to really understand uh, my faith better, this is going to be a great series for you. So I hope you'll join us as we dig into foundations, going through the Apostles' Creed together and learning what we believe. And with that being said, uh, I know there's so many more things going on. Again, the weekly update is so helpful for that. But let's continue on in our worship today.
Like I said earlier, this is our last week in our series Resilient, looking at the life of Joseph. And we've been talking about, hey, if there's anybody who knows about hardship and difficult times, it's Joseph, right? He was forced into slavery, falsely accused of a crime, unjustly thrown into a pit in an Egyptian prison, forgotten about. This guy knows about difficult times. He's been through so much, and yet he's standing strong. He's being resilient through all of these difficult times. Now, just to summarize the previous weeks and, and the things, some of the things that you and I have learned about what it means to be resilient, the first thing is that we need to trust in the good judgment of God. We need to trust that God will make all things right. And that frees you and I from a sense of uh, trying to get revenge or retribution or to hold on to bitterness. God will make things right. The second thing we learned was about the presence of God. That, that Jesus, uh, that he left this earth, but he sent the Holy Spirit. And that you and I, those of us who follow and trust in Jesus, have been given his presence to be with us no matter what we go through. Then we learned uh, in the third week about the empowerment of God, that, that we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We need uh, strength that only he can give in order to make it through the most difficult times. And then last week we learned about wisdom, the wisdom of God, and that we need that in order to have uh, the guidance and to be able to navigate this difficult life. But there's one more thing that I think you and I need, or, or one more thing at least that we can glean from the life of Joseph. There's one more lesson I think you and I should examine. So Joseph, at this point of the story, right, he's the number one guy in Egypt. The only person that's above him is uh, Pharaoh himself, right? He's actually overseeing all of the, the plans of all the cities and the food distribution that's happening there. Now, food distribution? If, if you don't remember, uh, Joseph is in this position because there was a dream that he interpreted that there would be five plentiful years of, of farming, of, of harvest, which came to pass. But after that would be seven bad years of famine and drought and, and difficulty. And so where we find uh, ourselves in this story is year two of that famine. And Genesis says at this point, after two years of famine, the entire world, which they really mean region, but the entire region all around Egypt was beginning to come to Egypt in order to find food. Well, sure enough, the most unlikely people show up at Joseph's doorstep. And that's where you and I will pick up in Genesis chapter 42, looking at verse 1. This is what it says. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? I've heard, he said, that there's grain in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph, Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he feared that harm might come to him. Thus the sons of Israel were among the other people who came to buy grain, for the famine had reached the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor of the, over the land. It was he who sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So Joseph, he was just 17 when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Now 22 years have passed. He's no longer that boy. He's now a 39-year-old man. And now he's ruling Egypt. Now listen, Jacob's brothers, uh, you know, Jacob's father, Jacob, the father of Joseph, hears that, that there's grain in Egypt, and so he sends uh, 10 of the 11 brothers. Funny that he doesn't trust his bro these older brothers with the youngest son again, right? But here they are bowing before the brother that they betrayed. Again, those of you who know the story well know this is actually a dream that Joseph had when he was very young that caused his brothers to actually hate him. Hmm. Now, there's some back and forth that happens in this story. 
But Joseph recognizes them even after all these years. Now, they don't recognize Joseph, but he sees them and he knows who they are. And he sends them away and he makes them bring back his other brother. So here they are, all 11 brothers standing before Joseph. And so here's the question. If you had been hurt to the degree that Joseph was hurt, how would you treat these brothers? See, the tables have turned. When he was 17, they were in power, right? They were the ones in control. They they betrayed him. They sold him off. But now he has the power, right? He's in control. He can do whatever he wants to them. And what does Joseph do? What he does, the, the compassion that he shows is going to show you and I something. It's something about how to be resilient in difficult times. So let's jump to Genesis chapter 45, and we'll see what happens. Genesis 45, 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. So Joseph reveals himself to them, and in doing so, his emotions overwhelm him. He starts sobbing. He starts crying so loudly, even the Pharaoh's household hears him. Joseph is experiencing a deep level of pain in this moment. Listen, I I think there's something that our culture doesn't do very well with, and that is the grieving and healing process. It's not something that we're always taught how to do very well. And so I'm just going to say, if you've been hurt by someone or betrayed by someone, I want to encourage you right now to give yourself space to grieve and to mourn over that. To express your hurt, really, even in a physical way. This is part of the process in which we heal. Joseph is a strong man not in spite of his tears, but because he has the courage to let it all out. He weeps. He cries out. That's part of the healing process. So let me ask this uh, one last time. Or say it one last time, sorry. It's okay to weep. Jesus wept in a difficult moment in his life. And you and I, we can weep in response to the difficulties we face. Let's continue on in this passage. Genesis 45, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Okay, we'll pause here for just a moment. They were anxious, right? They were fearful or dismayed at this revelation that this brother that they had betrayed is now standing before them. They don't know what to do. I mean, they were just bowing down to him, right? He's in control of the food in this land, and they are in Egypt. He can do whatever he wants to them uh, at this point. These murderous brothers, they're powerless, and he is powerful, So what's he going to do to us? That's the question I think is in their minds. Again, to be resilient means that we don't need to seek revenge on those who have hurt us. And that's not what Joseph's going to do. In fact, uh, what we see here is he's going to end up doing something that's amazing. He realizes that actually seeking revenge and, and, and holding on to bitterness that actually ends up just hurting you and I more. And Joseph knows that. And so that's not what he does. We're going to continue on. Uh, Look at verse 5. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing or harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Joseph recognizes the sovereignty of God in their lives. He's saying, listen, don't be fearful or dismayed. 
I know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about your actions. But I see that God has taken your actions and he's used them for, the, for his good and for keeping his promises. He's saying he sees that God is sovereign over all. In fact, he articulates this uh, a little while later in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says, even though you intended to, harm, uh, intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order pres- to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. Okay, again, he recognizes that God's hand is in all of this. And this passage in some ways foreshadows what Paul would later say in Romans 8, 28, which can often be misused and and sometimes it's overly used in cliche ways, but it's still true. And this is what it says. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Paul's writing to the church in Rome and he's telling them God's working things out. Not just the good parts, not just the happy parts, but all things. God is going to use it all. Do you see how Joseph and Paul were on the same page? They're saying God is ruling and reigning in their life. And even in the difficult moments of their lives. Even when they feel alone and feel abandoned. When they feel like everything is out of control. They recognize, no, no. He's with us. And he is still in control. Joseph believed this, and so should you. God is in control no matter what. God is going to work all things out. Joseph believed that. He looked at his brothers and said, You meant this for evil. You sold me into slavery. And yes, God allowed it, but he used it. And because he did that, so many lives will be saved. He wants them to see. People from all over the world are coming to Egypt and coming to him, and their lives will be saved because Joseph remained resilient as God slowly but surely put him into a place of leadership and influence. I'll say it again. God is in control no matter what. And Joseph clung to that truth. In Potiphar's house, he clung to that. In in prison, He held on to that. And and as he was forgotten in prison even longer, I believe that Joseph had to have believed that. God is in control no matter what. So listen, if you're struggling right now, maybe, maybe you need to hear these words too. God is in control no matter what. Listen, those people, they might have meant it for evil. They might have meant it to hurt. But listen, God can and do take, he can and will take those evil acts, those intentions for harm. He has power over them and can transform them and bring life through them. He's working all things out for our good and for his glory. But how does this work out in our lives? I mean, mean, it's nice to say, right? But how can this give us the strength that you and I need? How can this truth help us to be resilient? Practically. Well, I have a a few points of advice, okay? The first is this. My first bit of advice is to lean into God. What does that mean? It means this. uh, When we go through challenging times, when things get difficult, or when you and I are in pain, we tend to push God away. I I think our our, uh, base reaction is to put our hand out and hold God at a distance and say, I'm mad at you because you're allowing me to go through this thing, right? We, we tend to say, how could you? And, and we hold God at a distance. But listen, if you're going through a difficult season or if one's ahead, you need to lean into God. And a couple of things are going to happen. The first is you're going to find that he comforts you. Unlike anything else, God's ability to give you comfort and hope is unparalleled. You'll know what it's like to have a Father in heaven who's holding you and comforting you. You'll also know this, that we will learn so much in difficult seasons. 
I think we all know this. We know it's true, even if we don't really like it, that it's in the uncomfortable and challenging seasons in life that we actually have this space to grow and to change. C.S. Lewis put it this way, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. He will not only come for you, he will teach you. And have you ever noticed when we go through difficulties and, and hardship, there's opportunity there. Now listen, I don't think God wants bad to happen to you and I. But we live in a broken and fallen world. And even in the midst of, of difficulty and challenges, there's opportunity. Even when, when it comes to our personal relationships, when somebody harms you or hurts you or betrays you, there's opportunity to show grace and forgiveness. And that opportunity wouldn't be there unless there had been an offense to begin with. There's an opportunity. You have an opportunity to show others and show this world what grace and forgiveness looks like through your actions. I think there's opportunity even when we have been hurt. And I think that kind of reaction is what our world desperately needs right now. In the same way that Joseph's brothers, after 22 years, desperately needed grace and forgiveness from Joseph. So the first is you and I need to lean into God. The second thing, I think, is we need to have a long view of God's faithfulness. Friends, this was a process that took 22 years for Joseph, right? I mean, how many sleepless nights must he have had, wondering if he would ever see his father or his brothers again or his homeland? I wonder. 22 years. And often we see in scriptures that, that, that there's this promise that God is working, but, but the time between the promise and when we see, when, when the people who are living it can look back and see that promise and see God's faithfulness, it's a lot longer than any of us would like, okay? I think we often wish that God would work at our speed, right? On our timetable. We're like, hey, I've been quarantining for long enough. I want things to go back to normal. I want things to look like they used to, and I'm tired of seeing the same people or being in the same place, and I'm over it. You know, we, we are looking at things in, in terms of weeks and months, and we need to understand that our timetable, our, we need to grow in our patience. And so that's what we do. I mean, when we think about it, Joseph, again, 22 years. You and I need to patiently wait on the Lord to reveal his good plans. Listen, patiently waiting is part of the Christian faith, okay? We have this already. Like, we believe in this, this faith where we have something, uh, but not fully, right? We have this faith in Jesus and his kingdom, which was inaugurated, inaugurated as, at his resurrection, but we have to patiently wait in this broken and dying world for him to come back and make all things right. So just built into the DNA of the Christian faith is a long view, right, of God's faithfulness. Joseph trusted 22 years, and then he looked back and he could say, I knew God was up to something great. And listen, I'm telling you, if you patiently wait, if you are patient, you will see that too. And that's not always a welcome message when we're right in the middle of it, right? When we're feeling pain and discomfort and things are confusing and overwhelming. That's not a message we want to hear. But I'm telling you, it's true. So we need to have a long view of God's faithfulness. The third thing I think is this. We need to have a living hope. Hope is something that we desperately need right now in our broken world. If there's no light at the end of the tunnel... Well, that makes our hearts end up being pretty dark and cynical, okay? If you don't believe at the end of the days that God will come back and make all things right, man, listen, I think we need Jesus. 
because he is our living hope. We have this hope, and it's not a dead hope. It's not a, a hope buried. It is a living hope. That Jesus is going to reconcile all things. That King Jesus will come in power and glory, and, and that evil and death and pain and sorrow and brokenness will be no more. That his kingdom will be made realized in a new earth that will not pass away. In fact, you look at the story of Joseph. If you take a step back and look, you will see that the story of Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus. It's a gospel story. Think about it. Jesus was betrayed by his brothers and by humanity, right? The disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees and Pontius Pilate. They all, in their sin and brokenness, betrayed Jesus. And the rulers and the authorities, they meant evil for him. They wanted him dead. And God allowed this evil to take place. For Jesus to be arrested and falsely imprisoned, just like Joseph. To stand trial and be found guilty for a crime he did not commit, just like Joseph. And to be thrown into a pit. I mean, for, for Joseph, it was a prison in Egypt. And for Jesus, though, it was the ultimate sentence, which was death. The prison was the grave, just like Joseph. But just like Joseph, God's plan was to save lives, to save as many as possible. So God raised Jesus from the grave and put all authority under him, just like Joseph. He lifted him to the right hand of the Father, just like Pharaoh placed Joseph in authority. Do you see it? And he did this so that all who would come to Jesus with empty hands and in need of help might be saved. Just like we see Joseph's brothers bowing before him in need. Do you see it? This is the gospel that we have placed our hope in. That we, we know we can place our hope right now. And I think some of you, maybe that's where you need to be is you need to release control and you need to recognize that you are not in control and you never were. But the one who is ultimately in control is good. He's a good father who loves you and who you can trust to provide for you through his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to go in, back into our, our time of worship. When we come back, I'm going to pray for all of us as we end this series, that God would help us to take these truths and make them a reality in our minds and in our hearts that you and I can stay resilient. We'll be right back.
the story of Joseph, as we've seen, is really, at the end of the day, a gospel story. It's a story about how God is faithful and his desire is to save lives and to save as many as possible. And that even in this broken world where there's evil and there's chaos and there's division and fighting and betrayal and all these things and injustice, that God is moving the story along. That in his sovereignty, he is guiding this narrative. Not that he's causing all of this to happen, but rather he's grabbing it and making it conform ultimately to a plan that will lead to life and wholeness and his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And where you and I find ourselves in right now is difficult times, and it looks different for everybody. I'm not just talking about COVID-19, not just talking about job situations, I'm talking about marriages, I'm talking about family histories and past trauma. I'm talking about the cycle that you and I can find ourselves in where we make the same mistakes again and again the shame and the, the guilt that some of us carry because of decisions we've made in the past and we feel locked and weighed in by, by our past mistakes. There's a lot of ways in which you and I can go through difficult and challenging times. But God's desire is for you and I to be able to stand strong and to overcome those things, not through our own power, but by coming humbly to Him. Just like Joseph's brothers came and they bowed down before Joseph, recognizing they were powerless to save their own lives. They needed help. You and I need to do that as well. To have a moment of clarity where we recognize our true, utter need for Jesus, for God to rescue us. I believe they call this a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> Literally, right? We need that. The story of Joseph is a gospel story, and it's not just a story for him a long time ago. It's for you and me right now, today. And so what I want to do, I'm going to take a moment to pray. And again, I don't know what difficulty you're facing. I feel like we're all facing something, though. And I just want you, as I pray, to just visualize yourself bowing before Jesus, even if you've never accepted him before, maybe today's the day, to, to just in your mind to bow before him and to say, God, I need your help. Rescue me. Save my life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And, and, and he promised eternal life and wholeness and, and connection to the Father to anybody who would trust him. You can reach out and ask to receive today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the story of Joseph. He went through hell for 22 years, difficulty and challenges. But God, you had a plan and a purpose, and you took what was meant for evil, and you used it for good to rescue his brothers and his family and many people from starvation and death. In the same way, you came to earth in the form of a man. You walked among us. You were arrested evil and, and, and uh, sin and death had their way, were pressed upon you, and you received that because there was ultimately a good that God, on your death on the cross, sin, the sins of the world were on your shoulder. And as you were raised from the grave, you defeated death and sin and the devil. That God, you are victorious and all authority is under you and so we can place our hope and our trust in you. We can trust that you are in control no matter what. You can help us to have a bigger view of history and of our lives than this, this moment. This moment that's very confusing and challenging and where we're struggling. God, we can choose to have a long view of your faithfulness. God, help us to, to put our hope and our trust in you. And so right now, God... Even in our minds, we're visualizing as we bow before you. We bow before your throne, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We recognize that it's you who are in control. It's in your hands are the keys to life. And God, we are in need. 
And so we reach out to you with empty hands and we invite you into our lives. And God, we submit ourselves before you and we come seeking rescue. Help us. Help us to be resilient in these difficult times. Help us to place our trust in, a, in, in something that is firm and secure. Our hope is in Jesus. He's the anchor of our souls. God, we thank you. And we pray this in his wonderful name. Amen. Just want to let you know, if you have been if, if through this series, maybe you've had some sort of uh, what you would call a step in your spiritual life, in your faith, could you please just reach out to me? You can send me a private message through our online experience right now. You can go to the website or even Facebook and just send us a message. Could you let me know? It would be not just encouraging, but, but we want to actually help you and come alongside you and celebrate with you and see if there's a way that we as a church can help you continue to grow, continue to take steps in your faith, to follow Jesus faithfully wherever he leads you. All right? I'm so glad that you joined us today. Again, Next week, we'll be here at the church in person, 9 a.m. Hope you can join us then. But until we see you, may you go in the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus, the hope of the world, the anchor for our souls. We'll see you soon.